satisfies like you do. Jesus, the fountain that won't run dry, nothing satisfies like you do. And I have tasted life, and nothing satisfies.
Still you 
There's no 
Just the voices now, just the voices, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Bible talks about a, a hooker, a prostitute that came into a religious man's home, washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried it with his hair, with her hair. Jesus said, they that have been forgiven much, love much. Have you been forgiven much? Yeah. Hallelujah. How many of you are here today and you've got problems? That's good, you're alive. But this is the day. Hallelujah. Yom Kippur, where they, Tishavah means the season of the return, and it works really well in Canada as well, because September, you got to get everybody back from their backslidden summer position. 
And so we return. We return grateful. Grateful that we live in this country. You know, grateful that we have an opportunity to change our government in the next election. Grateful for those things. Praise God. If you weren't here on Sat if you weren't here on Thursday night, if you were not here on Thursday night, you you must listen to Ariel preach. I'm telling you right now, change your life. I've been I've been in churches all over America and other parts of the world, and I've never heard a message any better than what I heard here on Thursday night. While your backslidden cells were somewhere else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please. Miracles. Today is a new day. It is a day of miracles. Expect miracles. Forget yesterday. Forget the failures. Because your God loves you. And he wants to give his children good things. Rem don't think about what's going on in your head. Forget the impossible. God wants you to know that today you can have a miracle in that situation. You can have a miracle in your body. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Don't say it's, it's going to be progressive. Say today. Today. today is a day of miracles. God wants to do some miracles, instantaneous things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank Reach you, out Jesus. and trust and believe that God is going to do miracles. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Could you just give that mic to Jessica, please? She's going to pray over the offering and pray over the children. That's what I get for sitting in the front. Oh, my God. Lord God, I just thank you for who you are, Lord God. I thank you that you never change. Mm -hmm. I thank you that whatever season that we're in, that you still remain the same, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord God. And so I just pray over this offering right now. I pray for these seeds that are being sown. Lord God, you know the desires of our hearts. You know the things that we need in our lives. Um, um, promotions or, or jobs or whatever those things are, you already know what they are and you, you have aligned people in our lives, you've aligned situations in our lives for those blessings to come forth. So we just thank you in advance for all those blessings you're going to give us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray over the children. Are there any okay. kids here on the long weekend or short people? Can I get the children to come up? All the little children. Yay. Wow. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> he's gone. All right. Lord God, I just thank you for these precious ones here, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that there's no junior Holy Spirit. Lord God, that they learn the same as we do, Lord God. So I pray that as they learn uh, from your word, that they learn how much you love them, that you would just cover all of them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Short people, but Ken Matheson, you can stay here. That's fine. <laughs> huh? R.K. Stevens Electric was made famous on Facebook yesterday as well, if you haven't seen the post. <laughs> they ever put in a plug for you, but I don't know, you know. What's that? I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> it's all good. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. John chapter 1, verse 14. Woo! 
And again, the message translation says that Jesus came and moved into your neighborhood. <laughs> he's your neighbor, but he's closer than that, isn't he? He's closer than that. He came to demonstrate what the Father was really like because people did not know God. They knew about God. Matter of fact, it says that Moses uh, knew his ways and the children of Israel knew his acts. And so, so knowing the ways of God is what life is all about, knowing the ways of God, knowing that he's, as this verse says, full of uh, grace and truth, and you need two wings to fly the plane. You need the grace and you need the truth because truth can be harsh by itself. But when the grace is there to allow you to grow at your own pace and grow up, up in God, then that's, that's what it's all about. And so, so, and again, we understand that whatever God does in your life, whatever motiv his motivation is always found in 1 John 4 and verse 8, and I think again in verse 15 where the Bible says that God is love. And so it's not that he does love, it, it's that he is love. And, uh, and you're the object of his affection. I said you're, you're the object of his affection. You're, you're what he's all about. You're what he's all about. He's so in love with you and wants to grow you up and wants you to know how good he is and know that he's not to blame for all of the bad things that happen, right? Matter of fact, John 10, 10, the pivot point of the whole New Testament says that he came that you might have life, Zoe, that's a God quality life, and that more abundantly, he wants you to enjoy abundant life. What does abundant life look like? Well, when I think about abundant life, I, I feel like, you know, I, I have an abundant life, but, but let's take, for example, let's take somebody that religious people get upset with. Let's take <laughs> Kenneth Copeland, okay? We'll take Kenneth Copeland, and um, he's got a lot of money. A lot of money. Lots of money. What does he do with it? Well, for the past 15, 18 years, he's been sending a thousand bucks a month here long before we ever met him. I know uh, the prison ministry here in Canada, Monty Lewis's was getting 50 grand a year before Monty went home to be with the Lord. And one day Royce Harris had an experience. He, I was on his board back in the day and he needed uh, 9,000 dollars, 9,000 some odd dollars by the end of the year or he would be in danger of losing his building. And uh, he had no one, it was between Christmas and New Year's and he had nobody to call. He could have called me, but I would have laughed too. <laughs> you want how much? You know, no, you know, but I mean, he had no one to call. And on the last day, he went to the mailbox. And when he opened up the mailbox, there was a check in there for 9000 some odd dollars from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Now, he didn't know, Ken all he knew about Kenneth Copeland was what they taught him in Bible school, stay away from him. But he cashed the check, wouldn't you? Then, and then, then, he, then he came here every Sunday for about two years after that. He drove down from New Glasgow every Sunday because he wanted to get a hold of that truth that God wants to prosper you, that God wants you to. I mean, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says that you'll have all sufficiency, that you'll be able to abound to every good work. That troubles people, I know, but God put it in there. God wrote it. You know, he wants you to prosper. He doesn't, want you, he doesn't want money having you, but he wants you to be able to help other people out. He certainly wants you to help other people out. He wants you to be able to help others. You know, wouldn't it be great if instead of struggling to pay your own bills, you'd be able to pay somebody else's? You know, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, that's the way he wants us to live. But religion has kept us away from a lot of things that God wants for us. But the thing is, grace will grow you up in that. Like, you know, again, Genesis 8 verse 22 says, as long as the earth remains, summer and winter, cold and heat, day and night, seed time and harvest time shall not cease. And so there is, uh, there is a process that God uses called seed time and harvest time. And uh, it works like the law of gravity. Like the law of gravity, if I was to take this book and drop it, it would fall on the floor. But right now I'm suspending the law of gravity because I have it in my hand. The moment I let it go, 
the law of gra- the gravity will take place. Same thing with seed time and harvest. As long as it, I've got it in my hand, I'm suspending the law of seed time and harvest time. It's not until I let it go. That's why, that's why the socialist governments love welfare. Because not only can they control a bunch of people by giving them not quite enough We'll help you to exist, but we'll make sure you can't get off it because we'll make sure that you're almost up to the minimum wage so that if you decided to get off and go get a job, by the time you paid for sitters, you unwed mothers, you'd be in a deficit position, so they keep you there. Why do they do that? So that they can take the taxes from the other people that are working and keep them down too. It's all about control, you know. It's all about controlling the masses. That's, that's what government is all about. If you think they're there for you, <laughs> they're your elected officials, <laughs> call them up and try to get them to do something for you, and you'll find out how they're your officials. Anyway, I'm not here to attack the government. I'm just here to wake you up if you think that there's something, something special about them. No, you know, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. You're not going to elect anybody who's going to straighten out the mess that the world's in because the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of it. It's a great tool, but a terrible master, but the world is driven by it. And I don't know why I'm talking about it. It's got nothing to do with my message at all. Um, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're talking about grace and truth and, and what it is and what it is. And we found out that, you know, that um, it was grace that got Paul the Apostle converted and back serving. You know, he finally found the answer to his life. He had been a Pharisee. And in Philippians 3 and verse 6, it says, concerning the law, he was blameless. He kept, crossed every T and dotted every I. And he was so perfect, he would be welcome in any church in the land. And yet he was lost. He said he counted all his dung. He was lost. When grace, when Ananias came. And here's the thing about Ananias. His name means the grace of God. But when God came and called him, he said, I am here. Grace is there all the time. God's grace is there all the time. When you call on God's grace, the Bible says that his grace abounds toward you. Like he, yeah, he, he wants to, to instruct you and grow you up, but not with a hammer, with love, with dusting you off when you fall down, when you picking you up when you fail, when you fail, knowing that you'll have problems and that there's sometimes you have problems in life that you cannot deal with by yourself. And so we sent the Holy Ghost to live inside of you. Men ought not always, men don't always know how to pray as they ought, but when But when they don't know how to pray, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost comes with groanings that cannot be articulated in regular speech and will pray you out of a situation that you might find yourself in. How important is tongues? Well, you know, back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve spoke in tongues. And and right up until Genesis 10, everyone spoke in other tongues and interpreted tongues. It wasn't until the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10, I'm getting so far off my topic here. But in Genesis chapter 10, it said that um, it says that God came and he saw what they were doing and he said, because they are in agreement, which Ariel preached on on Thursday night, because they're in one accord, there's nothing that's impossible to them. And so he confounded their language. And the language didn't come back until Acts chapter 2, two in the day of Pentecost was come. They were all in one accord in one place and there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind and filled the place where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire and sat down on each of them. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians rather, chapter 14, it says, he that speaketh in tongue, tongues doesn't speak unto man but unto God. And howbeit in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. 
And Paul the Apostle said, I spent a thousand days over in Arabia praying in the Holy Ghost when I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I wrote two-thirds of the New Testament because I found out how important it was to pray in my prayer language. Hallelujah. So I don't know if you seem to be having some difficulty. Um, you, you know, you can quote the promises. They're all good, but there's a higher, there's a higher way than that. It's getting alone with God and praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says it makes no sense to you. It says that your understanding is unfruitful. That's why people have a hard time staying in it. You stay there. That's, that's what Adam and Eve lost. That's one of the things that they lost that God restored back to you, the power that comes from praying. In the, he, said, he said this way. He didn't say you receive other tongues. He said you receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The power is in the prayer. There's great power in that. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 2, we find an astounding statement there. We find, and again, we shared this a couple of weeks ago, Paul the Apostle said, receive us, for we have wronged no man. And we've read his backstory. We, we, we don't just read his highlight reels. We read Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 9. We understood that he was a tyrant. The Bible says that he went, in Acts chapter 8, that he went into every house in Jerusalem arresting Christians. He was a monster. Read about it. Look it up in the Greek if you want. Read the Greek language if you want to find out what he was really like. He was a nasty man. And yet... Here he is. Receive us, we've wronged no man. That's somebody that has embraced forgiveness. That's somebody that believed what John said in 1 John 1, 9. Matter of fact, in 1 John 1, he said, if you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar, <laughs> and the truth isn't in you. <laughs> you are all so holy you don't sin. Woo! No, that's the difference between the ideal you and the real you. The ideal you, don't you love the ideal you? That ideal you is so sweet all the time, never says anything nasty, never loses your temper, never gets angry, never gets frustrated, never worries or any of that. That perfect one. Oh, that perfect one. Oh. But then there's the real you, the one that God loves. God doesn't love the fake you, by the way. He loves the real you, the broken you, the one that struggles you. That's the one he's in love with. The one that, that really knows how much you need him. You need him. You need him desperately. Every single day you need him. On a good day you need him. On a bad day you need him. You need him. Because inside of you there's good, bad, and ugly. No, no, I mean, I, most of us would like to think we're good, but, but <laughs> Jesus said there's none <laughs> that, well, what did he say? He, he, said, he said, well, let's go. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 7? Now go to Psalm 8 in first, verse 5 first. I think it's verse 5 and 6. I'm not going back up there. I'm just going because I'm in a flow right here. But what it says is that God made man a little lower than angels. It says in the King James, but in the Hebrew it says Elohim. He made man a little lower than God by creation. But then it says that he crowned him with glory and honor and put him over the work of his hands. So that's who you are. And yet, Romans 3.10 says that there's no, no one that's done any good, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here you are, you're this person that you're created in the image and the likeness of God, but you've got these defects. And the Bible's going to teach us to embrace both. to accept yourself for who you are, to stop the war between who you want to be and who you are. Because that's where the biggest battle is in your life. The biggest battle in your life is not with the problems out there. The biggest battle is right in here. 
there's somebody that you want to be, and you're not, and you're frustrated. And the battle goes on, and God said, I want you to stop the battle through grace and truth. I want you to stop the battle in your mind and accept yourself. He says in Ephesians 1 and verse 6 that I made you to be accepted in the beloved. Don't you think it's about time that you accepted who you are? Don't you think it's about time? We're talking about grace and truth. Grace, uh, grace for other people? No, grace for you. Gra- allow yourself to grow in God. Allow experiences to come and, and work change in your life and word to let change in your life. And see, you'll never enjoy your today as long as you're looking in tomorrow or back at yesterday. You know, in my gym, it says right on the wall, it says, the only reason you look back is to remember how far you've come. And I thought, wow, the church needs to know that. You can't live back there and you can't live up there. This is the day. He said, take no thought for tomorrow. Why? Because it'll steal your today. It'll steal your intimate time with me. And you'll be sitting there with voices in your head, (laughs) the the real you and the ideal you, (laughs) all the time. Steal your peace. Steal your peace. You don't want anything stealing your peace. Where did I say go? Psalm 8. Well, let's not go there. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter. No, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 first. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Again, Paul's talking. He says, receive us. We've, we've wronged no man. And that's such a powerful thing for him to be able to say that. But you and I need to be able to say that too. You, no, no, you need to, when you, when, you, when you go to bed at night and you ask God to forgive you for negative thoughts, words, or actions, then it's done. It's done. Now you can say like Paul the Apostle, receive me, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, I remember, no, no, God doesn't remember. Hey, you want to remember, that's up to you, but I, I'm totally oblivious to it. Paul said, I don't, you know, again, Paul said, you know, you don't think that I could be your pastor, but he said, you you can't judge me before the time. (laughs) He said, I don't even judge myself. We get caught up in things, worry things. I'll tell you, can I tell you a worry story before I get the end of this? Okay. This is about 15 years ago, and I I had a swelling in my mouth, and uh, so I went to Dean Miller, the dentist, the best dentist in the city, because he's really from Tragically Hip, and he sings to you while he's working in your mouth and stuff. (laughs) He's in a band called called, uh, called, uh, Dazed and Confused. I said, Dean, which one are you today? Before you put your fingers in my mouth, are you dazed or are you confused today? I need to know. Anyway, this day he was confused because he saw the swelling, and he pulled out a molar, But then he said this to me. He said, if it's not a molar, then it's your lymph nodes. This is a dentist making a doctor's diagnosis on a patient, right? And so the swelling didn't go away. Days went by. So one day I'm standing. It's three. I didn't say anything to Nancy, you know, but you know, the the cancer word, right, comes to your mind. And, you know, the, the cancer word, it should start with an F, fear. Because that's where it's, when, it, when it loses its fear, it loses its power. But anyway, I, I was standing, I, I get up and I went downstairs and I'm looking out the living room window and I'm talking to God and I'm saying, God, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I know heaven's wonderful and real, but I don't want to go yet. And having all these conversations with God. You know, so when I finally went to the doctor, I found out that I had been working out at the sportsplex and went in the steam room. And something dissolved and got in my saliva gland and plugged up my saliva gland, and that's what, that's what it was. Why are you telling me that, Pastor? Well, because maybe, just maybe, maybe, maybe whatever it is that you're looking at is no big deal either. Don't let the devil, mag- you know, th- this is why David taught those guys, come and let us magnify the Lord Stop magnifying your difficulties, magnifying your problem. Make the problem so big and so huge. Receive the grace and the truth. The grace will cover you as you're growing. 
the truth will bring you correction and instruction as you grow. And so Paul said, receive us, we've wronged no man. Then he goes on and he talks a little bit about it, and it's pretty powerful what he has to say here. As soon as I find it, I'll be with you. Receive us, we've wronged no man, we've corrupted no man, and we've defrauded no man. Hmm. This is a guy that persecuted the church unto death, bound and delivered Christians into prisons, both men and women. I did this last time I read this verse. I want to do it with you again today. This is what, this is what Paul the Apostle did. You want to do it with him? Say this with me. I release myself, I release myself. from mental and emotional turmoil. From satanic attacks that speak to my conscience. And I decree that my conscience is clear. My conscience is fully cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And I'm acquitted. And I'm justified. Amen. Hallelujah. Then let's drop down to verse... 10, he says, he says this, look at this, he says, there is a sorrow, not a, um, not guilt. Know the difference between conviction and guilt. Know the difference between conviction and shame. You're feeling guilty, you're ashamed of yourself, anything like that, it's wrong. It's wrong totally wrong you know I, I might not like what I've done but it's not who I am <laughs> who are you I'm a child of God I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus I might not like what I've done but it's not who I am I've learned how to separate myself from these actions amen why because he became sin so that I become the righteousness of God in Christ right Hallelujah. So he says here, for godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation. Or, and again, the word salvation is the word sozo, soteria. When I belong to Coal Harbor Place, I use this as an example because it's the best one I have. In Club Soteria in Coal Harbor Place, I could use the pool, I could use the rinks, I could use the gym, I could use the sauna, da 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 but all we ever did, myself and Pastor Paul, was go in there at 5.30, two or three or four times a week and work out in the gym in the mornings. That's all we ever did. But everything, everything else was paid for. But we took the part that we wanted. Well, in salvation, that's what this is the same thing. Soteria means you get the whole package, uh, but don't cherry pick the things that you like. Take the healing too. Take the prosperity too. Don't just take, I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. No, no. He said, I can't, you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's here and now. The third John 2, beloved, I pray above all else. <sighs> this is the Apostle John, the guy that boiled in oil and couldn't kill him, threw him on the Isle of Patmos and he wrote the book of Revelation. That guy. <laughs> you know, he's got some credentials and he said, he said, this is it. He said, my number one prayer for you by the, unction, by the unction of the Holy Ghost, he's the one that talked about the unction of the Holy Ghost in chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and 20 and 27, talk about you receive a teacher and get an unction from the Holy Ghost. He's the guy that said, Beloved, above all else, my number one prayer for you is that you will prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So he's indicating as we renew our minds, everything else begins to grow along with it. You go along with it. So this godly sorrow brings repentance. But look at this. But the sorrow of the world works death. What's the sorrow of the world? I'm stupid. I always make mistakes. I never get it right. I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm bad. I'm worthless. Whatever you want to add to I am. That's, that's the sorrow of the world. But the sorrow of God is that grief that turns you toward wholeness. It's godly and it's not regretted. It's the grief that kind of, 
It's kind of like this is what I have, you know, I said, I said to somebody yesterday or the day before, I said, if this keeps up, I'm going to be a great pastor before it's over. <laughs> because what I have learned over all these years, that it's the brokenness that really did the work. <laughs> it wasn't when everything was going well, it was when everything sucked all around me that God was able to work in my life because that's what Paul the Apostle said. He said, ah, he said, he said, three times I sought the Lord. Take these problems away from me. How many of you ever prayed that? Take the problem away. Take the problem away, and God keeps coming back with the same answer. I got my grace for you. My grace is sufficient for you. And then he goes on and says, because my grace is made mature, made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul said, yea, that when I'm weak, then I am strong. He recognized that there was a work going on in the inside of him and that the problems were not his enemy. The problems were there to grow him up. He didn't create the problems, but Romans 8, 28 says that all things will work together for your good. So when bad things are happening, they're working something good in you. They might be working bad in somebody else, but they're working good in you because it's growing you up. It's getting you to a place of trust and faith in him. So he says here, he says here, this sorrow of the world is nothing but it's nothing but self-pity and destruction. That's what it is, self-pity and destruction. It'll destroy your life. You don't want it. You don't want it. You want to be like Paul the Apostle who said, hey, I received, I received his grace. I received grace on the road to Damascus, and I still have grace working in my life every day. He said, by grace you are, he's the same guy, Paul, that said, well, it's by grace that you are saved and through faith, it's not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of works, <laughs> lest any man could boast. You got nothing to brag about, but you got nothing to be ashamed of either. <laughs> huh? Hallelujah. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am. Who is that, Papa? I am what I am. <laughs> But now we can take a look at this and see, we need to take a look at this and see how it worked in Judas and in Peter because God will always give you examples. He said, that let everything be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 26. I circled uh, verse 65, but, but it's got nothing to do with what we're going to do right now, but I just like sharing verse 65. Is that okay? This will be a nugget. Verse 65 is from Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 6. In Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 6, it says that the, if the high priest rents his garments, he's disqualified himself, right? So look at what this high priest is doing in front of Jesus. The fake high priest is identifying the real high priest by ripping his garments. Look at this. Then the high priest ran his clothes, saying, He spoke in blasphemy, and further need have we of any witnesses. Behold, now we've heard this blasphemy. So here's a guy, just disqualified himself. Was that Ananias or Caiaphas? Well, Caiaphas, I think, yeah. Anyway, so, um, but verse 66 is what I wanted to look at. Now Peter sat without the palace, and a girl came to him and said, Are you with the tribe of Judah? He denied them all and said, no. Nope. Then a little while later, he was out on the porch, and somebody said to him, are you, are you with this fellow Jesus of Nazareth? Again, he denied the oath, and he swore an oath. About, one translation says that he cursed. After a while, there came unto him a, a, they came unto him and said to Peter, surely you are one of them, your speech. We can tell you from Galilee, you have that accent. And uh, then he began to curse and to swear and said, I don't even know the man, and immediately the cock, Crew crowed. Anyway, so, so, you know, we understand if you go back to Luke uh, chapter 22 and verse 30 that Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. So the Lord believes what he prays and he knew it was all going to turn out right. But Peter didn't know that. Peter was macho man. And he said, no, no, I'm ready to die with you if necessary. But when, when the pressure was on, of course, he denied Jesus three times, and Jesus told him he was going to do that. But look at this. 
he went out and he wept bitterly. Now we'll look at, we'll look at him again in a minute. But let's just jump into chapter 27. Judas, another guy that denied Jesus. When the morning was come, the chiefs and the elders and the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him and led him away, they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that they, that they were going to kill him, he repented himself. But this word repent is not metanoia, where you change your mind. This repent is more like, I got caught, I'm guilty. And so guilt brings, come on, guilt brings shame. What happened to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3? We ran and hid because we saw that we were naked. Guilt and shame, that's from the devil. Guilt and shame are always from the accuser of the brethren trying to make you feel like you're not worthy of God's love. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's always a lie. Repented himself, and he brought the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief elders, saying, I've sinned and betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? Look at this. He cast the silver down in the temple, and he wrote a note, and he hung himself. And my takeaway from this is don't attack badness in yourself. Don't attack badness in other people. You know what? There's no one in here that has pure thoughts. There's no one in here, no one under the sound of my voice that thinks scripture verses all day long. Other thoughts come. Carnal, flesh thoughts come. Sin thoughts come. Are you shocked by that? You, come on. When are we ever going to? Hi, I'm Gary and I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to get back to that. Not, not, not that I'm an alcoholic anymore or any of that, but I'd like to get back to that. Can we just be real? I've got problems. You've got problems. We have a problem solver. No, no, when, when you know, I, I don't need to be finding bad in you to make the good in me better. And I don't, but worst of all, the worst of all is I don't need to be finding bad in me. Because like Ariel said on Thursday night, how can I, if I love you the way I love myself and I don't like myself, there's not much hope for you. <laughs> right? If I don't even like me, you think you've got a chance in my life? None. No, it starts with accepting yourself. Blood bought, Holy Ghost taught, growing in the things of the Spirit of God. And that's why he said, don't compare yourselves among yourselves. He said, that's not wise. Somebody might be growing really fast. Somebody gets out of school and starts a business when they're 25, and it succeeds. Somebody else starts one when they're 45, and it succeeds. Somebody else starts one when they're 30, and it fails. It doesn't matter. Failing doesn't make you a failure either. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I shall arise. You know, and, you're not, and your gift is not somebody else's. That's why he said, don't compare yourself to somebody else. Be you. There's only one you. Be happy with who you are. God made you in his image and in his likeness, and he made you to love you. But now let's go. We need to go to Luke's gospel to see what happened to Peter. Somewhere in Luke's gospel. Uh, chapter 22. Verse 54 says, Peter followed afar off. Well, that was his problem, and that's many times our problem too. We press in when we have a need, but we follow afar off the rest of the time because, and, and even then, there's a lot of, you, you know, there's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot of distraction in our world that other generations did not face, other nations do not face. There's all kinds of things demanding your attention, but separating the urgent from the important is what we need to be 
act of doing. So it says here, Peter followed him afar off from a distance, it says in another translation. And so he had broken fellowship. He had prayer failure. He had some things going on. But, but of course, and then we read that he, he kindled a fire in the midst of the hall. And they sat down, and Peter sat down among them. And a certain maid saw, saw him by the fire and looked at him earnestly. said, I recognize you. You were with him. He denied it, said, woman, I don't even know him. Can you imagine? And after a little while, another woman saw him and said, you're with them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of an hour later, another one confidently affirmed and said, of a truth, this fellow is with him. He is a Galilean. Peter said, I don't know the man. Immediately the, the cock, the rooster crowed. And the Lord, but look at this. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, if he had seen judgment and condemnation, he might have joined Judas. But he didn't. Let's, let's, he, he'll even tell you what he saw. He turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. He remembered the word of the Lord. He remembered the word of the Lord. Yes, you're going to deny me, but when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Come on, he saw, what he saw were two pools of love looking at him in the midst of all this chaos. Love stopped everything and looked at him. And then it says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly because he saw the agape love of God for the very first time. He saw it. He saw that he had denied Jesus at the most crucial time in Jesus' life. The most crucial time in his life, he denied him in front of a whole crowd of people three times, and all he got was forgiveness and love. Something maybe you'd like to ponder yourself. Were we going to Ecclesiastes at some point? Let's go to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7. So Peter had, Peter, had, Peter had good things and bad things going on in his life. In Matthew chapter 16, they're walking into Caesarea. And when you walk into Caesarea, there's statues of gods all over the place. And in the middle of all that, Jesus said, who do, you, who, who do they say, who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? So the son of man am? And, and they said, well, some say that you're, you know, uh, Elijah, some say that you're John the Baptist or one of the prophets. But then he said, but who do you? This is what's important. Here's a question you need to answer too. Who do you say I am? Because whoever you say he is, that's what he is for you. If he's your healer and you say it, he's your healer. If he's your provider, he's your provider. Who do you say that I am? <laughs> who do you? you? Ask yourself that every day. Who do I, who's Jesus to me? I am that I am. What does that mean? I am whatever you need me to be whenever you need me to be that. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll never leave you. I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the smeared on one, the anointed one with his anointing. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turns around and says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Who'd want to be related to Jonah, not me? <laughs> Blessed art thou, Simon Bar, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. In other words, you just got revelation knowledge from heaven. So the revelation knowledge of, of heaven made him blessed, right? Just, just a, a couple of verses later, in that same chapter, just a couple of verses down the road, down on that same page, Jesus is saying, I got to go to Calvary. I got to go lay my life down. And Peter says, well, it's just not going to be so, Lord. And this same Jesus that said, you're blessed, turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that good and bad can flow in your life. Am I the only one? Are you guys that pure that I should be having you up here teaching me today because I'm just learning some of these things and Look at you all, so sweet. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. This is not an excuse to sin. The grace by itself would be an excuse to sin, a license to sin, but it's grace and truth. Grace and truth and time. Grace and truth and time. 
When Adam and Eve fell, they fell out of the eternity and God created time so that he could grow them up. So that he could grow them up. So that he could start the growth process all over again. He locked them into time. He could not leave them in eternity because for an eternity they, they would have been filled with guilt and shame. So he had to take them out of that environment. He had to take them out of that garden. He had to put them in time so that he could teach them. Up until then, they didn't need to be taught. They were flowing in the Holy Ghost. Maybe it was tongues, the interpretation of tongues, I don't know, but it was awesome communication in the cool of the day. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7. Verse 15. He said, all of these things I've seen in the days of my vanity. In the King James. There is a just man that perishes in his righteousness. And there's a wicked man that lives a long life in wickedness. Be not righteous over much. Neither make yourself over wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not much wicked neither. Or be thou foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, that you should uh, not with, that you should also from this withdraw not your hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth from them all. What does this all mean in another language? What he's really saying here is avoid extremes. You know, between legalism and license, if you will, between grace and truth, if you will. But one translation says it this way. Now remember. When Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, he had been like a rock and roll star. He, he had overdosed on life. I, I mean, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't have a big screen in his bedroom. He had guards all around, and a band would come in and play him to sleep at night. And he had trophies from all over the world, and he had so much silver that it was piled up outside the city because it was useless, because there was so much gold available. Uh, I've been to the place where his stables were, where all of his horses were kept over by the Valley of Medego. I mean, the guy had, had towns with, that were set up just for his chariot riders and their horses. Like he was the wealthiest man that ever lived. You know, we're glad to hear about Amazon.com and that guy. Why were you happy to hear about him? Anybody that can make $200 million a day answers the question for me. I got into it with a, with a well-known person on Facebook. Facebook is sometimes in your Facebook. And uh, this guy was ragging on Jesse Duplantis for believing for a $54 million aircraft. And, and so I got back on there and I said, that, I said, your response is like Judas. This money should have been saved and given to the poor because he had a list of things that could have been done with $54 million. But I wasn't upset with him. I was only pointing out the fact that $54 million to God is nothing. He could have done that and that and meet all your needs and all your needs and everybody else's needs on the planet. The truth of the matter is that, you know, there's just a couple of percent of the people on the earth that have all the money. But there's no shortage of money. Don't ever, don't ever believe that. How bad is it if, you're, if, you, if you have got a bed to sleep in and you get two meals a day and a roof over your head, you're in the top 5% on the planet right now because all the money is being hoarded up by the devil in his crowd. And yeah, the wealth of the wicked is laid up in store for the just, but the just are not interested. Ooh, Hallelujah. <laughs> So here's, here's, but here's Solomon. When you overdose on life and you take God out of the equation, anything that's built that doesn't start with God ends up in destruction. And so he ended up in destruction until you get to chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes where he said the conclusion of the matter is this. <laughs> you know, fear the Lord and obey his commandments. <laughs> that was his conclusion. But he overdosed on everything. Nothing was withheld from him. And so he got depressed. How many of you know when you set a goal and you attain it, you feel good about it? But I've, I've, I know people that have, been, that have been blessed with so much money that they've never developed any character, never ever had to go get a job, never ever had to go to earn any money or anything, and so they sit like lumps. Totally destroyed. Why? Because seed time and harvest time was taken away from them. Seed time and harvest time is supposed to be an exciting thing. Harvest time is exciting. Why? Because you planted and you watered and you worked and you worked. Endeavor's over there putting up that new building. But how many years of work have gone into getting her where she is today? 
in how many setbacks and money loss and, and discouraging things that happen, but, but there's joy in harvest. And that's, what, and that's why God wants it there. He wants you to have joy in your life. That's why he doesn't do what this rich person did to her, kid, his, <laughs> her kids. Just load them over with money and let them sit like lumps. Never ever have to work for anything. That's, that, that's, that, that's how you ruin a life. And God won't do it for you either. I, you know, I know this one guy. I was, just, I was trying to talk to him. I slid a hundred bucks over across the table to him in a restaurant one time. And hey, it wasn't, it wasn't a while back. A hundred bucks was like a thousand back then. I slid it to him. He opened it up and said, well, that'll help a little bit. And I'm thinking in the name of Jesus, at least he could have prayed over it, right? But then I found out the guy was going to the mailbox every day, look, expecting a check from God, but he wasn't working. Checks in the mail. <laughs> That's like waiting for a ship to come in if you haven't sent one out. <laughs> Just waiting for my ship to come in, brother. <laughs> he said, in my pointless life, I've seen everything from a righteous person perishing in his uprightness to a wicked one who lives a long life and kept on doing wrong. So don't be overly righteous or overly wise. Why should you disappoint yourself? <laughs> But don't be overly wicked and don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Don't grasp just one of these rules. Take hold of the other as well. For he who will, is in fear of God will live by both of them. Another translation says it's good to grab the one and not let go of the other. Those who honor God will hold on to them both. What does that mean? It's like Paul said, I, I, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I'm not going to try. We need to stop playing the game. Acting like we got it all together. You know, let's, can we just be real? Like if you're hurting, it's okay to tell somebody you're hurting. Be careful who you tell, though. <laughs> the Bible says, bear your one another's burdens. It doesn't say gossip about one another's burdens, right? So, you know, but God, God will put people around you that you can share it with because we are, as, as Ariel taught so well on Thursday night, we are the body of Christ and we need each other. If we're a body, then we we have things that I remember when we went to the California Redwoods on the Harleys, and I, I'd never seen anything like it. It took 18 of us to surround one tree, hold hands to pray. That's nine pastors and pastorettes around the tree. A huge tree, huge tree. And so then there's one laying down. It tipped over, and the roots are just there's nothing to the roots. So then there's a, a sign there describing the roots. The roots on those huge trees that have been there for thousands of years are only 10 feet deep. Huh? Just 10 feet deep. How do they stay up? Because they're hooked up to one another. And so storms of life that have been coming for thousands of years and those trees are still there because they're hooked up to one another. Not only that, if one tree has a disease, the other trees will quarantine that tree so that nothing is going to flow out of that tree into the other trees, but they're going to continue to flow the nutrients into that sick tree and make it well again. Mylon was looking and he said, how do it know? I thought, there's a the question. How does it know? God put all, you know, he said, all of creation will declare my glory. All of creation. I'm watching these birds getting ready to fly south. I'm saying, not yet. <laughs> but, you know, you get a couple hundred of them. You ever notice them bumping into each other? Ever notice them crashing? They all going like that. Try that in downtown Halifax. Let me know how you make up. God, but God. So, so you know, he said, "Hang on to both." And Paul was uh, Paul. We'll finish with Paul over in Romans chapter seven. Just give me ten more, five more minutes, seven more minutes. I'll read a verse that will become clear to you in a moment. Verse 14, we'll start there. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For that which I would not do, I allow not. For that which I would do, I do not. For that which I hate, I do I. If then I do, which I would not, I consent that the law is good. Now then, it's no more I that do, but sin that dwells in me. And how much wood can a woodchuck chuck? A woodchuck can chuck wood. Makes no sense, does it? Makes no sense in the King James. 
But this is what he's saying. He's saying, I don't understand. I'm supposed to be born again. But something on the inside of me is working out a wrong direction in my life. What am I supposed to do? I don't even practice the thing that I hate. The, the thing that I'm supposed to do, I don't even practice. And the thing that I hate, I keep finding myself doing. <laughs> no, but this is how you stop the war between the ideal self and the real self. We got to find out what Paul did. Another translation says it this way. For I do not understand my own actions. I'm baffled and bewildered. I don't even practice or accomplish the things I want to. I do the very thing that I loathe, which my moral instruction condemns. Now, if I habitually do what is contrary to my desire, I acknowledge and agree that the law is good, moral excellence is good, um, and, and, uh, and I take sides with it. Another translation says, we know that the law is spiritual, and I am a creature in the flesh, having been sold into slavery and under the control of sin. So he's saying, he's saying, you need to do what I did. Romans 8, 1. He said, what is the answer for my dilemma? He said, the thing that I don't want to, the thing that I want to do, categories my. He said, I, I, I never get it done. He said, the thing that I'm supposed to prize or the thing that I'm practiced, I don't even get to. And then he says, the thing that I don't want to create, poeo, he said, I keep finding myself doing it. He said, what am I supposed to do with me? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now. When is now? now? No condemnation to them. Who? That are in Christ Jesus. And in, in italics it says, who walk not out of the spirit of the flesh. It does say that again in verse 4. But what he's talking about walking, he's talking about learning how to walk out in the grace of God, because you're not in any condemnation, because you're not in any condemnation, you're just, you're just practicing. I practiced sin until I was a professional drug addict. There was no better drug addict in my city. Ask the police department. I had to write a letter to the police department when I got born again to ask for forgiveness. I was a professional idiot. And so then, I go to church, I get born again, and after a couple months, nothing's working. They were giving me rules and regulations that I could not possibly do, sending me door to door to witness, and I hated that and still do to this day. If that's your niche you have at it, don't call me, I'm not going. Well, do the work of an evangelist, brother. I will, but no, you ain't going you knocking door to door. <laughs> you find your own path and I'm sticking on mine. But, 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 but you know, so, so after a few months, I left the church and just like the Bible says, I was seven times worse a sinner. But there was something on the inside of me then. The Holy Ghost was sitting up on the inside of me then, drawing me back to him. And when I came back to him, I found out I have to grow up. I've been born again and now I have to grow up. Are, are you mature yet? In some things, very mature. In other things, not so much. How about you? Huh? But you know, I don't find any fault in you. You don't find any fault in me. God doesn't find any fault in any of us. It's a good day. It's a good day. It's a liberating day. There's no condemnation in me. Will there be conviction by the Holy Ghost? Yeah, you ought not to do that. Come on, you ought not to do that. Have you ever picked up a tool and in the, vo the voice in the inside said, you ought not to do that? And the next thing, blood is flowing and you're thinking, I should have listened? That's it. It's learning how to function by the moving of the Holy Spirit. And how long does it take? It takes a lifetime. None of us I, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but none of us are going to arrive unscathed. No one is going to get to heaven and say, wow, we've been waiting for you. you. You're the one, the sinless one. Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one good and his God. 
If there's only one good, then I can take the pressure off myself. Chandler, are we keeping you awake, buddy? <laughs> no, he yawned, and I'm sure I saw Toronto. I mean, that was... <laughs> wow. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll never embarrass you. You never have to be concerned about that. It's a long weekend. We're done. We're not having service tonight. Not because we don't like church, but because you need some time to go do whatever it is you do on Sunday night when you're not in church. This time you can do it without feeling guilty. (laughs) Be free in Jesus' name. Have a good day.